Hello, my friends. Namaste. Uh, today's topic is different methods of calculating secondary progressed house cusps. So we're going to be talking about secondary progressions, and there's this issue with secondary progressions that there are different ways to calculate the house cusps. Secondary progressions are one of the most common methods used by modern astrologers to forecast the future. And they're based on this idea that a day after, oh, I've got a typo here, a day after life, a day after birth equals one year of actual life. So, for example, suppose you're 40 years old. Um, you're 40 years old, you're going to calculate a chart for when you're 40 days old, for 40 days after birth, and this tells you what happens in your 40th year. Suppose you're 40 years old and three months. Then you do three months is one-fourth of a year, so you do 40 and one-fourth days, you know, and, and it would be calculated precisely because you have this internal cosmic clock that every year of your life, this internal astrological clock goes around one day. Uh, sounds weird if you're not familiar with it, but that's the idea. Okay, so you add a day for each year of life and you get this chart. So, the calculation of the progressed chart should be simple. The planets and the houses should be simple. Just calculate a chart for one day, uh, you know, for each year of life at the rate of, you add one day for each year of life. That's it. Um, but um, some astrologers, uh, probably most astrologers, don't like the house cusps that they get if you do this. And they may not consciously know that in because they may not have thought through all the astronomy and all the variations, but I think when I explain this, you'll see that it's it's sort of distasteful, okay, um, to use this formula. So they have to add a second rule for the houses. So to show you what the problem that a lot of astrologers have with secondary progressions is, I'll do a chart for two consecutive days. We'll do John Lennon for the day he was murdered and the following day, just um, so we have two consecutive days. So here's this chart wheel. I'm using a different wheel style than I than I do in different videos, just just to sort of vary things a little bit. So there's his natal chart. Um, okay, what do I want to do? I want to progress this chart. Okay, so I'm going to progress this chart. I click on progression for December 8, 1980. I won't relocate it. I'll leave it Liverpool. And these last two choices for how to progress the midheaven and the way you progress the midheaven affects all the house cusps, you can use Nabot in, in RA, that's a common choice, and Solar Arc. These last two are very popular choices. Mean Sun I don't think is used as often, and time is not used very often, but time means do, and I'm going to select time, means do the progression according to the rule. Don't add any additional rules, don't monkey around, just give me a day equals a year. Thank you. So I click OK, and I get it. And I have 9 degrees Leo rising, 17 Aries on the midheaven. Now, to show you the problem that astrologers often have, we'll go back to the natal, and we'll progress it for the following day. Just go one day later, December 9, 1980. Um, we're not relocating again. It remembers my previous selection as my preference time, so I've already got time selected. I click OK, and now I have 10 Leo rising and 18 Aries rising. In case you don't remember what I just said there with all this minutia detail, I'll do two wheels, um, and I'll put the progression for the first day on the left, the progression for the next day on the right, and... I'll click OK, and I have my two wheels so you can see what I'm talking about. There's that 9 Leo 26, progressed for the next day, it's 10 Leo 06, a little less than a degree, and all the houses have moved about a degree. The Midheaven, for example, has moved a little more than a degree from 17 Aries 26 to 18 Aries 30. Um, so there you go, they'll move one degree in a day about one degree. Does that make sense? Let me show you the next slide. Um, yeah, it makes sense, because in one day the Sun would move about a degree, right? 
I mean, the sun moves about a degree a day, and that becomes a year of life. How far do the houses move in a day? They move all the way around, because they're moving, you may know this formula, moving one degree every four minutes, means they move all the way around plus a degree. So you do a chart for right now, and then do a chart for one day later at the same time, the houses will have moved all the way around plus a degree, 361 degrees in 365 days, almost the same number of degrees as days, means the houses are moving about a degree a day uh, by progression. Um, so it works. So no problem. The houses are moving a degree a day. Um, the sun is moving a degree a year. It's actually kind of nice. It's sort of aesthetically pleasing. Things are moving, you know, houses are moving one degree a day and sun's moving one degree a year. Um, so it looks fine, no problem, a day equals a year, but there's something astrologers don't like about this. It would be nicer if the houses moved one degree a year. I'm kind of laughing because, well, I mean, they don't move one degree a year, but we want them to move one degree a year, um, not 361 degrees. Uh, so why is that? Because if I go back to the natal chart, we astrologers often notice that if you take the number of degrees from the midheaven or number of degrees from the fourth house <clears throat> that a planet is, so the moon here looks like it's about 26 degrees past the midheaven, so when he's about 26 years old, he'd have some kind of moon midheaven event in his life. Uh, this is what we often see, or Mercury is sextile the midheaven, actually it's about 61 degrees. So when he's about 61 years old, he'll have a Mercury Midheaven uh, event. Well, unfortunately, he didn't reach 61, so we don't get to find out. <clears throat> but you get the idea. You count the number of degrees. So we find this works, and we would like our progression to show us that. But it doesn't. It's so, what do we do? So one thing that's happened is when astrologers were doing charts by hand, before computers, you know, back in the, say, 50s, 60s, they would often calculate the chart, the progress chart, for the birthday. Sort of a logical thing to do, made your calculations a little simpler. And if you calculate the progress chart for the birthday, what's going to happen is the houses will move about one degree um, a year, because they've actually moved 361. So, um, so I've written here, some astrologers avoid this problem, the problem of 361 degrees, by subtracting 360 and always calculating for the birthday. And then they, that extra degree gets spread over the year. Now, that, the way I'm explaining it, you may say, wow, that's a lot of fudging just to force the houses to move one degree a year but on the other hand, you know, astrologers say, you know, it's, it's sort of natural to calculate it for the birthday, and it, it moves to 361 degrees. Um, some astrologers who did it by hand don't even realize that they did it for another date. It's not moving one degree, it's actually moving 361 degrees. Well, anyway, you can argue back and forth, but, you know, if it works, or you, that's what you want, then that's what you do. And to get that, um, you use the Nabot and RA. Nabot and RA means you're moving the midheaven by the mean motion of the sun in right ascension. I won't get into the technicalities of that, uh, of the astronomy, of what that exactly means. But it gives you the same result as calculating the chart for the birthday and seeing how far past the 360 degrees the planets went. So let's do that. Let's go to John Lennon natal chart and we'll progress his chart for December 8, 1980. And we won't use the time method. We'll use Nabon and Right Ascension. We click OK, and we get a Midheaven of 14 Aquarius, which is going to be roughly 40 degrees after where it was when he was born. Um, the, the Ascendant moves a little more erratically, the Midheaven a little more regularly, because he was 40 years old, um, a little over 40 years old when he died on December 8, 1980. So if I go back 40 degrees, that would be 4 Capricorn. His midheaven is 7 Capricorn. So you could be off, 
you know, three, four degrees easily. Um, it's not exactly one degree because we're using, you know, how far these things move according to this formula, but it's roughly a degree. Fine, and if I did his progression for a year later, let's see, the this is uh, 14 Aquarius 53, if I go back to his natal chart and progress it for December 8, 1981, I'm going a year later, he's still using the Nabod and Right Ascension, we've got 15 Aquarius, 15 Aquarius 52, the previous year, it was 14 Aquarius 53, almost exactly one degree, so we're getting the one degree motion a year. So this is the problem. The problem is the progressed houses, if you just use day equals year, move 361 degrees. Astrologers very often prefer it to be one degree, and they use these different formulas to force it to be one degree. Now, uh, if we look at the history of secondary progressions, it gives us a better appreciation for what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> First of all, secondary progressions were almost unheard of until the 1600s. So you have, you know, uh, if you say astrology goes back to three or 400 BC, you know, in terms of how we do it, or, or the 100s in terms of the books being written that we still have today, that's a long time, you know. Um, and there's very little evidence of secondary progressions existing. Um, they use something called primary directions, through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. And the primary directions are like secondary progressions, but instead of a day equaling a year, four minutes equals a year, which sounds even crazier. Every four minutes after birth equals a year of life. And this makes the houses move one degree per year of life, not 361. So there's no problem with primary directions. But when secondary progressions were introduced, uh, that introduces this problem of not having the one degree a year that we would like for the house cusps. Um, and uh, to give you a little history of this, because it'll help us understand it, Placidus de Titus, who lived in the 1600s, uh, by the way, you'll see it pronounced often, spelled U.S., and, um, but anyway, apparently the correct spelling is T-I-T-I-S. Anyway, and he's often just called Placidus. Um, he's well known to us now because he also developed a house system um, that we use nowadays. So, uh, I don't know if he developed it or, or uh, I guess he actually did develop the formula. But in any case, or he popularized it. I think he actually developed it. But in any case, we know his name. And he's credited by some classical astrologers. Classical astrologer means astrologer who focuses on medieval and renaissance methods, basically. Um, so Placidus is often credited for inventing secondary progressions. So not only, according to this theory, were progressions hardly ever used, they were never used because Placidus invented them in the 1600s. Um, and some scholars say that he considered secondary progressions secondary in importance to primary directions. So he also used primary directions, as many astrologers did in those days. But he came up with this idea of a secondary progression, and he maybe he called it secondary because it was of secondary importance. That would make sense. In any case, that's one idea about where they came from. Um, is there's very little evidence of them existing before then. But you do see some, some references that sound like secondary progressions. Uh, Vedius Valens, who lives in the 100s, um, and wrote some of the first books that are available as to us today, wrote the following in book nine of, of his set of books we now call the Anthology. Uh, let me just read this very quickly. It is necessary to calculate as follows. Add a number of days to the birth date equivalent to the age in years of the native. Well, add the number of days in the birth date equivalent to the age. It sounds like maybe he's using a similar, similar formula. And then having first determined this date, whether in the following month or birth month itself, cast a horoscope for that day. The instructions are a little fuzzy here. He says, which star, if any, is in the ascendant? So he seems to be only using the ascendant or coming to another star and whether it's moving to an angle. It doesn't seem like he's doing the whole chart. So it's not really a clear 
description of secondary progressions, but it, it sounds a little bit like it. He mentions this idea that sounds similar. <clears throat> so there's some little evidence, because most of the ancient books were lost. Now, so, you know, maybe they're, they're, if they weren't lost and burned and all that stuff, maybe we'd have more understanding of whether they used secondary progressions. But if they were used, they were not very popular. Um, that much seems pretty clear. Now, some of the early 20th century astrologers, uh, influenced by theosophy and the mystical traditions, um, I believe Manly Palmer Hall, Hall was one of the people, I couldn't find the quote on it, said that there were um, biblical references to the day equals a year. So I googled around looking for the references, and I found these. Um, now this is going way back in, into BC times. Um, of this idea of a, of a relationship of day to year. And listen to this from Numbers, uh, the book of Numbers. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years and you shall know my displeasure. So, a year for each day, that's kind of curious. Just that the phrase shows up. Um, oh, i got a typo here. It says, Ezekiel. i got an X instead of a Z. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and he talks about lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. Interesting. And then he talks, so talks about getting on your other side and 40 days, a day for each year. Interesting. Um, another quote in the book of Leviticus. For Now this one um, maybe is not as clear, but you'll get the idea. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops, but in the seventh year the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows or of itself or harvest the grapes of your in, in, untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Well, you know, you know the idea of this creation, seven days, and God rested on the seventh day. <clears throat> now the land is going to rest on a seventh year. Maybe it's a little less straightforward. I don't know, but there are... You know, these seeming references of a day equaling a year going back in the Bible. So, I don't know. Um, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, also, interestingly, some biblical scholars believe that a year in biblical times was 360 days, not 365 and a quarter days as we now think of it. And some of the Hellenistic Time Lord systems, these are the ancient uh, forecasting methods. I have another video uh, introducing them also use the 360 days in a year. So there seems to be some connection between biblical writings and astrological methods. Okay, so anyway, a day equals a year. Um, it, the concept appears to go very far back and was formulated clearly by Placidus in the 1600s. And we get this idea of a day equaling a year. Um, uh, but we have this problem that we want the houses to move a degree a year, and probably one of the reasons is because they, they do move a degree a year in primary directions, and astrologers stopped using primary directions uh, for the most part. Now they're starting to revive them again as we revive the ancient material, but we still like this idea of moving a degree a year. Um, so how do we calculate secondary progressed houses? An alternative to Nabot and Right Ascension is Solar Arc. And there are some studies that support the Solar Arc Midheaven. There's a book, Progressions, Directions, and Rectification by Zipporah Dobbins. She does case studies, so she's following somebody's life all the way through instead of purely anecdotal. Robert Blaschke did some case studies. He also concluded that the Solar Arc Midheaven was the best way to do it. Um, and let's see uh, secondary progressed houses on the date that John Lennon was murdered. We'll get some more ideas. Okay, that's my last slide. Okay, so let me show you this. Um, I've already shown you 
the calculation using um, Nabot and Right Ascension. And what I want to show you now is, let's see, this is my fifth chart was for 81. Okay, this is the one for 1980. I want to show you something interesting. If I take his progress chart on this date he was murdered, December 8, 1980, and I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to select an astro map of the progress chart, and I'm going to select excitement and instability. Um, this is a map based on uh, basically Uranus, upsets. And so when there's an upset, uh, a trauma, a catastrophe, then um, it often shows up, I found, in this excitement and instability. Excitement is sort of the nice way of looking at it. I find that this map shows instability. Um, and at best it's excitement, but too often it's instability. And what I've done here is I've moved this map over to catch the east coast of the USA, which is where John Lennon was, was living in, and he was murdered, <clears throat> where he was living in New York City, and he was born over here in England. And let's see if anything shows up. If I click OK <clears throat> to select this map, these treasure maps take a little while to calculate because they do this very fine shading. So you do have to be patient and wait five or ten seconds on most computers. And we see here that there's an instability line running east of New York. Here's New York City, where my cursor is. And it's running off the east edge, really through Boston. And it's Uranus square the ascendant, and also a Sun-Uranus midpoint on the ascendant, going here. And then where he was born, we would have to zoom in to get a better picture of that. And I can do that as well. But what I want to show you right now is I want to go back and do it by solar arc. So I'm going to go back to his natal chart, do a progression for December 8, 1980, but I'm going to use solar arc. <clears throat> the solar arc midheaven instead of the Nabot and Right Ascension progression, I won't, I won't relocate it. I'll click OK, and there it is, 25 Gemini 43, which is about 2 degrees different from the Nabot. Nabot has 23, Gemini 22, about 23 and a half degrees, and the solar arc has a little over 2 degrees later. Now if I go to the astro map, and I do the same kind of thing, treasure map, excitement and instability, and I'll use this thing to quickly uh, reposition this in the Atlantic Ocean, zoom out a little bit, zoom up here, so I see England here, I see New York here, that's good enough, um, and I'll click OK, just thinking about this, treasure map, excitement and instability, good. Uh, and wait my 10 seconds or so, <clears throat> excuse me, and by the way, I could have assigned my reports from the other one to this one, but anyway, I reselected it. Now this is interesting. The Uranus square the Ascendant and the Sun-Uranus midpoint, if you use midpoints, that's a you know, pretty unstable combination, goes right through New York. So the relocated Ascendant, based on the solar arc method, <clears throat> goes right through New York. Now you might say, oh, you know, a lot of stars don't relocate their progressed houses and say, well, that's, you know, that's just a coincidence or something. We really need to look at here. Well, we can do that. We can right-click. We'll change this to, to uh, United Kingdom to can <clears throat> get the whole set of islands there. And we'll do the excitement and instability and see what happens. And I've already done this before I started this presentation, and it won't pinpoint Liverpool exactly. Whether I do it by, whether I progress the houses by um, by the solar arc or the Nabod, 
And so where am I here? Here's Liverpool. <clears throat> so the nearest thing I've got are these minor aspects and things going up here. Um, I've got a Mars Uranus midpoint. That would be very powerful. But it's considerably off Liverpool. Now if the birth time is incorrect by five minutes or something, that may move this over and I could do a time adjust to see. But I don't want to get off the topic. The main point I want to make is that um, <clears throat> the um, it doesn't show up in unstable for the birthplace, but it does for the relocated place. And another way to show you that is to do this. I'm going to go back to his natal chart, and I will progress his chart to December 8, 1980, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll select Solar Arc, yep, Solar Arc selected, and I'm going to relocate it to New York City. In other words, what that astro map was showing you is um, that in New York City the progressed houses were were uh, disruptive, so to speak. So I'll, let's actually look at the chart. I could have clicked on it on the astro map, but I want to do it this way to, sh to actually just calculate the chart. What's happening here? <clears throat> this is the relocated uh, that, a secondary progression using the solar arc midheaven method and I've relocated it to New York and what we have is the Sun very tightly square the ascendant ascendant's 24 Aquarius uh, not the Sun, Uranus the planet of <coughs> sudden change Uranus square the ascendant and in fact the Sun is square the ascendant as well but two degrees but that puts the midpoint of Sun and Uranus at about tw early 25 also square the ascendant. So the Sun Uranus midpoint, actually the Sun Uranus midpoint is conjunct the ascendant. So the midpoint is right here at 25 Aquarius. Uranus is square the ascendant, uh, half a degree. The ascendant's conjunct the Sun Uranus midpoint, half a degree. It's right in there at this explosive point, relocated. So in, you know, my work I do with progressions, I see this all the time. The relocated houses uh, using the solar arc progressed method for the midheaven seems to to really work. And that's one of our problems is that most of us astrologers are using anecdotal evidence, just the charts we do. Um, <clears throat> we get really strong emotional impact when you do these charts. You see that you're in a square the center, you see that you consult your clients, you know, it's very emotional, it's very powerful. Um, but still, it's anecdotal evidence in the sense that, you know, we don't collect a bunch of data and analyze it. So it's hard to know what works and what doesn't work. And I just think we should be more cautious than we often are and, and not jump to conclusions too quickly. Um, and, and, you know, until, you know, we've worked with something a long time and, and start to see how it works out and hopefully get more controlled studies. Case studies are good. Uh, and several people did case studies tend to find that that uh, midheaven <coughs> progressed by the solar arc, that method really works. Um, whether the NABOD works or not, some astrologers are very, very strong believers in it, um, and some are not. So, you know, you we need to have more thorough books, like the book that um, Zip Dobbins did, to, to show and compare. And even the things like I'm doing here, where we look at... Uh, a big event like a death, an accident. Look at the progressions. It takes time. Progress it using NABOD. Progress it using solar arc. Try relocating it. Does something show the accident, the misfortune, the tragedy, <clears throat> uh, or not? I also tried this with uh, uh, Princess Diana. We see the Venus Uranus midpoint um, on the regal. I could I could show you that, but I'm at a, almost a half hour. I think I'll stop. But uh, did it with Princess Diana and the Venus Uranus midpoint on the ascendant using solar arc method and relocating to the to the place where the tragedy occurred in Paris and the Venus Uranus midpoint just makes a lot of sense to me given the context and what was going on and so on so uh, so I found this to work um, but the main thing I want to talk about is just the different methods why there are different methods what the problems are my tendency is to 
to not try to introduce too many odd rules and maybe a day equals a year I can accept that um, but the solar arc really maybe is a good way to do it because that's really just another method uh, of of predicting and I can make a video in the future on solar arc directions so really we're just putting a solar arc midheaven into a secondary progress chart maybe what's really going on here which is nice to have so anyway, I hope that helps. I hope that gives you some sense of the history, the background, the issues, what's going on, uh, why there are different methods, um, and the ultimate test is what actually works. And we, like I said, you know, some astrologers feel very strongly about certain methods. You know, they're just extremely like, this is the way it is. I know it works this way. Well, that's great. You know, write a book. Do what Zip Dobbins did. Show some examples. We need we need those case studies. We need the comparisons of different methods to to sort this out so everybody can learn from the uh, experience of different astrologers. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll finish right here. Thank you very much for listening. Take care. God bless. Namaste.